Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by. My name is Brent, and I will be your conference operator today. At this time, I'd like to welcome everyone to the Siena Fiscal Q1 2022 Financial Results Conference Call. All lines have been placed on mute to prevent any background noise. After the speaker's remarks, there will be a question and answer session. If you'd like to ask a question at that time, simply press star followed by the number one on your telephone keypad. If you would like to withdraw your question, again, press star one. Thank you. It's now my pleasure to turn the call over to Mr. Greg Lamp, Vice President of Investor Relations. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you, Brent. Good morning, and welcome to Siena's 2022 Fiscal First Quarter Results Conference Call. Our call today is scheduled for up to 45 minutes. With me today is Gary Smith, President and CEO, Jim Moylan, CFO, and Scott McFeely, Senior Vice President of Global Products and Services. In addition to this call and the press release, we have posted to the investors section of our website an accompanying investor presentation that reflects this discussion as well as certain highlighted items from the quarter. Our comments today speak to our recent performance our views on current market dynamics and drivers of our business, as well as a discussion of our financial outlook. Today's discussion includes certain adjusted or non-GAAP measures of Siena's results of operations. A reconciliation of these non-GAAP measures to our GAAP results is included in today's press release. Before turning the call over to Gary, I'll remind you that during this call, we'll be making certain forward-looking statements. Such statements, including our quarterly and annual guidance, discussion of market opportunities and strategy, and commentary about the impact of COVID-19, supply chain constraints, and geopolitical dynamics are based on current expectations, forecasts, and assumptions regarding the company and its markets, which include risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results to differ materially from the statements discussed today. These statements should be viewed in the context of the risk factors detailed in our most recent 10-K filing and in our upcoming 10-Q filing, which is required to be filed with the SEC by March 11th. We expect to file by that date. CN assumes no obligation to update the information discussed in this conference call, whether as a result of new information, future events, or otherwise. As always, we'll allow for as much Q&A as possible today, though we ask that you limit yourselves to one question and one follow-up. And as a reminder, we will be hosting investor meetings with the sell side at OFC tomorrow and Wednesday. We look forward to seeing many of you there. With that, I'll turn the call over to Gary. Thanks, Greg, and good morning, everyone. Before I speak to our results, I would like to express our care, concern, and support for the people of the Ukraine. Those with friends and family in the region and with all of our employees, customers, and partners who are feeling the weight of this situation. This conflict in the region is leading to tragic outcomes for the Ukrainian people and with a significant and growing humanitarian crisis underway. We will be making a corporate donation to Ukrainian relief efforts in addition to reinforcing with our employees our Siena Cares matching program. Whilst the company has very limited exposure in the region, and we do not expect there to be a material impact on our global business. We are complying with all U.S. and international sanctions and export control requirements imposed on Russia, including having already stopped shipments upon the escalation of the conflict. When combining those actions with our strong position to stand in solidarity with Ukraine, we have made the decision to immediately suspend our business operations in Russia. Like everyone, we will continue to monitor the situation and specifically the potential for broader geopolitical and global economic consequences. Moving to our Q1 results, today we reported fiscal first quarter revenue of 844.4 million, adjusted gross margin of 46.2%, and adjusted operating expense of 290 million in line with the revised expectations we communicated a few weeks ago. As a reminder, these quarterly results reflect specific supply chain disruptions that happened late in our first quarter and occurred within an already challenged logistics environment that was worsened by the Omicron surge. 
To be clear, we have subsequently managed through those specific disruptions that occurred in Q1. Importantly, long-term secular demand is very strong, driven by the acceleration of cloud adoption and traffic growth and the desire to get higher capacity and more bandwidth closer to the end user. As a result, we're seeing extraordinary demand that is generating significant momentum in our business, including unprecedented levels of order bookings for our products and services. This is broad-based across our portfolio and geographic regions. Our order volumes are also benefiting to some extent from security of supply behaviors with customers giving us extended visibility into their needs as well as some demand catch-up type spending. As we mentioned a few weeks ago, we are sharing additional metrics this quarter that we don't typically provide. These metrics illustrate the demand environment and help form the basis of our confidence in the year. Specifically, our book-to-bill ratio in Q1 was in excess of 2.5 of quarterly revenue. This ultimately resulted in a backlog of more than $3 billion exiting the quarter providing exceptional visibility for the full fiscal year. Another highlight from the first quarter is strong revenue diversification. As we maintain our clear leadership position in web scale, we continue to benefit from prioritized spending in DCI. In Q1, this resulted in non-telco revenue now composing nearly 41% of our business, up 16% year over year. Direct web scale revenue of 20%, an increase of 10% year over year. In addition, we had a solid contribution from cable MSOs in Q1, driven by both our long-standing customers as well as many smaller customers with whom we've been gaining momentum. MSOs overall comprise 10% of total quarterly revenue in Q1, up nearly 70% from a year ago. From a portfolio perspective, our core optical business remains incredibly strong, and we continue to win more than our fair share. We added 16 new customers for WaveLogic 5 Extreme in Q1, bringing our total to 156 customers globally. Also in Q1, revenue for our flagship 6500 platform increased 20% year over year. This performance reflects the monetization of some of the new deals that we secured over the past couple of years that are now beginning to deploy. It also includes activity with existing customers who are now building out additional capacity and new routes. As we indicated previously, we anticipated the shift in product mix for fiscal 22, and we expect it to continue throughout the year. We expect this to result in a higher percentage of revenue from line systems and common equipment than we've seen during the last two fiscal years, particularly in our core optical business. We also continue to win new business for next-gen metro and edge use cases. In fact, we reached a milestone of 150-plus total adaptive IP customers during Q1. Overall, in routing and switching, we had a strong first quarter with revenue up 33% year over year, including a 12 million contribution from the Viada platform that we recently acquired from AT&T. Our software and services business also continues to gain momentum. Revenue for Blue Planet Automation software and services was up 25% year over year and revenue for our platform and services, software and services was up nearly 50% from Q1 of last year. Within that business, revenue for our newly introduced MCP domain controller almost doubled from this time last year. Now with respect to the supply chain environment, as we mentioned a few weeks ago, deliberate actions we've taken to invest in our growth will provide us greater flexibility beginning in the second half of this year, basically to manage current supply chain challenges. Specifically, we made decisions roughly nine months ago to place significant orders with our suppliers 
to meet our expectations for a strong second half, similar to last year, and an outsized 22 revenue growth rate. We've been accumulating components that are not as scarce today in order to be efficient and prepared to produce finished goods more quickly when supply constraints ease for semiconductors and integrated circuits. Additionally, we've invested in manufacturing capacity that we expect to come online later this year. Overall, we are very positive about the strong demand environment, aligned with additional supply chain capacity and flexibility, and increased visibility into the remainder of the year based on our order flow and backlog. With that being said, I'll hand it over to Jim to review additional financial details of Q1, as well as provide our outlook for Q2 in the context of our expectations for the full fiscal year. Jim. Thanks, Gary, and good morning, everyone. As Gary mentioned, total Q1 revenue was $844.4 million. Adjusted gross margin in the quarter was strong at 46.2%. This reflects a particularly strong revenue contribution from our software and services businesses that helped to offset some of the impact of the higher supply and logistics costs we are seeing. And Q1 adjusted operating expense was $290 million. With respect to profitability measures, in Q1 we delivered adjusted operating margin of 11.8%, adjusted net income of $72.6 million, and adjusted EPS of $0.47. Cents. In addition, we used cash from operations in the quarter primarily related to significant investments in inventory, something we believe will be a significant differentiator over time. And finally, adjusted EBITDA in Q1 was $123.7 million. Reflecting the addition of the net proceeds of our successful bond offering in January, <clears throat> We ended the quarter with approximately $1.7 billion in cash and investments. With a strong balance sheet, we continue to return capital to stockholders. In Q1, we entered into an ASR arrangement under our new share repurchase program, repurchasing $250 million of common stock in the quarter. The final settlement of the ASR was completed in Q2, and approximately 3.6 million shares were repurchased through the arrangement. Keep in mind that we have an additional $750 million authorized under our current repurchase plan, which we intend to utilize by the end of fiscal 2024. Turning now to our guidance. As we said a few weeks ago, we continue to expect to achieve our annual revenue guidance of 11 to 13 percent growth for fiscal year 22. Our confidence in this outlook is based on a very strong demand environment, expected benefits from our continued investments in supply chain capacity, and greater visibility provided by our order flow and backlog. More specifically, we expect a strong second half performance this year primarily driven by a significant increase in supply chain capacity in the second half. You'll recall that this is similar to the revenue profile we delivered last year, with particularly strong growth in the second half over the first. With respect to Q2, we expect to deliver revenue in a range of 930 to 970 million dollars and adjusted gross margin in the 42 to 44% range. This reflects our expectation for a revenue mix in Q2 that includes a larger proportion of lower margin common equipment. Take into account our gross margin performance in Q1 and our outlook for Q2, we continue to believe that our gross margin for fiscal year 22 will be in the range of 43 to 46%. Finally, we expect adjusted operating expense in Q2 of approximately $300 million. In closing, 
We are taking advantage of our market leadership within a very strong demand environment, leveraging our differentiated balance sheet, leading innovation and R&D capabilities, and deep and growing customer relationships around the globe as strategic advantages. We expect investments in our business, including in our portfolio, our go-to-market resources, and importantly, our supply chain capacity will position us well to navigate challenging market conditions and deliver the outsized revenue growth in fiscal year 22 to which we have guided. Lastly, before we open the call to questions, I want to highlight that we continue to make progress on many ESG initiatives. We recently made available an updated presentation on the IR section of our website that provides new details on our activity in this important area. We encourage everyone to take a look. With that, Brent, we'll now take questions from the sell side analysts. At this time, I would like to remind everyone, in order to ask a question, please press star, followed by the number one on your telephone keypad. Again, please limit yourself to one question and one follow-up. Your first question comes from the line of Armit Dariani with Evercore. Your line is open. <coughs> Yep. Um, thanks for taking my question. Uh, you know, I, it's just a first question on my side. Uh, can you just talk about, you know, historically what does price increases look like for CNL uh, in terms of what you do for your customers, um, and, and how does that look like in calendar 22, uh, and what's sort of embedded in your guide from a price pricing perspective? I'm sorry, I'm that you're, say, you're talking about price increases? increases. Price increases. Yes. <clears throat> Well, the dynamics of our industry have always been such that technology reduces the cost of our goods by, you know, just uh, 25% a year or, you know, a significant amount of, of, uh, of cost reduction in our products, which competition basically causes us to pass along to our customers. That uh, When you get a 30% increase in the underlying demand for capacity, that's how you get to an industry that grows 5%. So it's... It's actually been uh, common for us over many, many years to uh, show lower prices per unit of capacity. Um, now, we are talking with our customers today about uh, the fact that our costs actually have gone up quite a bit, particularly with respect to semiconductors and integrated circuits. And so um, we are talking with our customers about sharing in this cost increase. We don't expect that that will have much effect this year. If anything, it'll be an effect for next year. But price increases are, are somewhat of a rarity in our business. Um, fair enough. And then you know, I was hoping you could just uh, spend a few minutes just talking about the web scale business. Uh, you saw a nice double-digit growth in the Jan quarter. Um, you know, sort of what is enabling that organic versus share gain, and how do you see that segment stack up for the rest of the year? Hi, Amit. Uh, you know, I, I think what we're seeing is obviously increasing DCI build-outs globally. Um, you know, and we, we've got a very large market share in, in web scale, as you know, but we actually think we're, we're probably going to be taking share based on some of the uh, commitments that we're seeing uh, being placed on us uh, already. So I think it's just a very healthy uh, market that's, that's really building out more and more data centers around the globe. We have multifaceted relationships with these web scale players, both in terms of domestic, international, submarine, um, and I think not just in terms of point to point, but also a very large 6,500 network capacity with, with a lot of these players as well. So it was a very, very good quarter and we're gonna have a good year with web scale. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Tim Long with Barclays. Your line is open. Thank you. Um, yeah, Gary, I was hoping you could talk a little bit about, um, you know, some of the businesses you're calling out, um, routing, switching, and, and you know, the software and, uh, and Blue Planet businesses that, that performed very well in the quarter. Um, could you talk a little bit about kind of, you know, cross-sell in that area, how are, are you willing, you know, how good are you at um, kind of pulling the install base over and, and you know, how much of that is winning 
uh, you know, new customers with, with those offerings. Uh, and then the follow-up would just be, could you just talk a little bit about the, the Europe and Asia theaters? They look like to be a little bit under pressure year over year. Was that components or is there something else going on in those regions? Thank you. Okay, why don't I, um, why don't I take that one first, Tim, and then, and, and then work back through and then talk about the software and cross-selling, and then Scott will talk a little bit about the packet uh, routing and switching. Um, on the Europe and Asia, we're seeing you know strong demand across all, all geographies. So I think really Q1 is more about supply constraint than really you know extrapolating out too many uh, dynamics around the different geographies. Particularly in Europe, we're seeing strong demand really after after a period of, of underinvestment, frankly, over the last few years, even pre-COVID. So I think Europe's going to be very strong. Uh, India, I think, was also down in Q1, but I think he's going to have a very good year, you know, based on the order flows. So that's probably a good example. I just think it's, you know, wouldn't extrapolate too much out based on the, the challenges around supply, uh, you know, constraints, which is going to be with us for a little bit for a while. On the uh, software side, as Jim said, we had a strong, strong quarter, you know, good growth on both Blue Planet, which really is focused at the service creation uh, layer and the automation. We've seen a lot of carriers, particularly as they've gone through COVID, really now prioritize their, the automation of their network. So we're seeing, you know, very healthy demand in, in Blue Planet. Similarly, MCP, which is really the automation at the network layer. Now, you know, the, 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 the numbers look, you know, uh, very good from a growth point of view, but we're coming from a, you know, it's a newly introduced uh, uh, platform. Um, but, you know, we're very encouraged what we're seeing there. And that's into, we've now got MCP into pretty much all of our major uh, customers uh, around the world. And that gives us a platform to upsell various applications on top of that. And then obviously into the services layer with, with, with Blue Planet as well, which is part of our strategy. And then obviously as we're, we're seeing the convergence of uh, Packet and Optical, you know, we've invested heavily in our switching and, and routing portfolio. Scott, any other? Yeah, just on the routing and switching piece, I think where we're seeing uh, strongest demand and the biggest success is where our service providers or MSO customers have built out their fiber fiber plants closer to their end customers, whether that be um, you know a wireless play, an enterprise play, or a residential play. Um, and obviously, we've got tremendous relationships with those service providers and MSOs around around the world, so that helps in that conversation. As we look forward, um, we're certainly starting to see some of the the uh, tier two and tier three. Uh, providers looking for end-to-end -end solutions, so, so being able to offer both the, the core and those access and aggregation solution plays um, to our strength as well. And as you think about the next generation metro and edge, we firmly believe the winning hand there is going to be um, optimized routing and switching, optics, photonics, and multi-layer control. And you know, Gary talked about the software assets there. Those have a strong um, uh, value proposition when you start to look at those networks coming together as well. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Tom. Your next question is from Rod Hall with Goldman Sachs. Your line is open. Yeah, hey guys, thanks for the question. Um, I just wanted to come back to this backlog of $3 billion and ask a couple, maybe a couple questions on that. One is, um, do you expect that to rise further in the, you know, coming quarter or two, or, or do you think that this is the peak and you start to work the backlog down, and then my follow-up will be regarding backlog as well? Well, it, it, it's um, always dangerous to say what's going to happen in any given quarter with respect to orders, but we do expect a strong order flow this quarter, and I wouldn't be surprised if the backlog grew this quarter. Uh, and, you know, as we look out, we're going to have a very good year. I, I just ask everybody to remember, though, that a lot of this order flow is people giving us visibility into their order flow, into their demand for this year, and in some cases even into next year. And so uh, it, it, it's, it's great. It's wonderful. We're seeing strong demand, but I shouldn't extrapolate what's going on now into any sort of revenue expectation. 
Right. Yeah, that makes sense, Jim. And then I wanted to also ask, um, you know, it's, it's great that you guys have this visibility to the year. I think that's the first time I've ever seen that on CNN um, with, you know, that kind of visibility given the industry. But I was wondering where you think you might finish the year in terms of backlog. Uh, you know, what do you expect half that to be gone? Can you give us any idea kind of where the backlog might end up by the end of the year? Rod, I, I, I absolutely get the get the question. I just don't think that would be appropriate for us to extrapolate out, uh, you know, because we'll then get into a conversation about 23. Um, you know, we're one of the few companies that's actually giving guidance for the full year of 22. I think we'd be getting a little ahead of ourselves to that. But, I mean, to Jim's – to Jim's point, it, it, it's a very strong demand characteristics. It's security of supply, absolutely. There's, there's a, a, a large portion of that. But we also feel that the secular demand around cloud adoption, you know, is going to give us a, you know, a, a, a multi-year um, platform here for, uh, for growth. So we feel very good around, you know, the secular dynamics of our space and our, our position in it just continues to, to get stronger. In all likelihood, you know, to, to put a pin in it, you know, we are going to probably have orders outstrip revenue in, in Q2 as well. That's our, uh, that's our expectation. We'll see how that plays through for the, for, for the rest of the year. Okay. All right. Great. Thanks a lot, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks, Thanks Rob. Your next question is from Paul Silverstein with Cowan. Your line is open. Thanks. Um, Gary and Jim, I was hoping you provide some more granular insight regarding revenue diversification from a customer perspective. I know there hasn't been meaningful concentration in a long time, but as you look forward over the next four quarters and beyond, I assume the strength you're looking at is not a function of any one or two customers, but is far more broad than that. But any granularity, both within the web scale and more broadly beyond web scale, and then I've got to follow up. We're seeing demand uh, very broadly around the world and across verticals, Paul. Um, we, uh, our, our concentration numbers, generally speaking, haven't changed significantly, except that our, the percentage, which our two biggest customers uh, represent, has come down quite a bit. But our, our top 10 customers are, you know, around 50%, and that's been that way for a long time. I think it will continue to be. But beyond that, uh, you know, the, the top 10 customers in terms of volume, we have a whole long list of customers that are uh, seeing the same kind of demand on their networks that the bigger companies are. And we are winning our fair share, or more than our fair share, frankly, of all of those build-outs. All right. So, so, and then, I'm sorry, Gary, go. Go, Paul. Uh, within routing and switching, how much of the growth you're looking at going forward is a function of new customers, new projects, after those new customers versus new projects or extended projects that exist in customers? And I'm talking organically. You know, exiting out the biota. Impact. You're talking about winning routing and switching from customers who are not current optical customers. Is that what your your question? Is that the well, basis of well, your question? No, I'm talking. I'm, I'm I'm talking about routing and switching incremental revenue from. Well, I would articulate it. I think your question is is how how much of it is sort of continued build outs from existing footprint versus new new application footprint, not necessarily new Sienna customers customers, but new application footprint. Well, well, how much is from existing routing and switching customers? How much is from customers that haven't yet bought routing and switching? Okay, I think it depends on the time horizon. Uh, certainly, the the growth trajectory that we see in routing and switching has a, has an expectation and dependency on us winning new logos. But for 2022, the bulk of it is sort of existing existing applications and existing customers. Okay. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Paul. Your next question is from Simon Leopold with Raymond James. Your line is open. Great. Thank you for taking the question. I, I know you, you've talked about uh, your efforts to, to raise prices to offset costs, and you've counseled us that it doesn't really affect fiscal 22, but is effective in fiscal 23. 
given uh, the progress to date, do you have a sense of how to quantify essentially the revenue growth tailwind for fiscal 23 coming from the price increases? Uh, essentially, I'm looking for some quantification and some sense of, of the progress you've made talking to customers about higher prices. And then I've got a quick follow-up. So, I mean, let me, let me take that. I think, you know, it, it's an ongoing conversation. I think they've progressed very well. Obviously, most of our major customers understand very well the, the global issues that we're all facing. So I would say it's been very constructive and, and very positive. Um, but, I, uh, you know, as Jim said earlier, that's not going to impact uh, you know any of any of our financial performance probably in, in in this year, and I think you know just from a 23 perspective, Simon, it's it's way too early to start talking about next year. I mean, I um, you know we're already providing pretty detailed guidance for this year, and we're one of the few companies to do that. I just don't think it would be appropriate for us to get into you know those kinds of things in, in about 23. Uh, I would say. You know, we are, we feel very positive about the strong secular demand and our, and our position in the space, and we think this is going to be a you know clearly a, a multi-year you know growth platform for us. But I, I just don't think it's appropriate to get so far ahead of our skis right now. Okay, and just as my, my follow-up, uh, it it appears that your services gross margin was actually uh, a bit better than than the last. Uh, four quarters or so. I'm just wondering whether there was something unusual in this quarter or whether we should think about uh, more sustainability of a better services gross margin. If so, why? Well, as you know, Simon, our services revenue stack is made up of a whole uh, list of projects that are in various stages of their uh, life's lives. And um, so I just attribute that movement to ebbs and flows of the business, you know, it's going to move around a, a bit. I'd say this, we've been very pleased with the progress we've made on our gross margins in services over the last several years. We've done a lot of things in our, our services uh, supply chain and capacity uh, set to uh, enable that gross margin, and so we're pleased with where it is, and, and hopefully it'll get better over time. But we don't think that uh, you know you should take too much out of any one quarter. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Jim Suva with Citigroup. Your line is open. Thank you. I think it was in the prepared comments by Gary. You mentioned uh, kind of a, a little bit more line business. Just curious, is that because you've seen a, a meaningful increase in demand for it or because you have the ability to secure the supply of such products and therefore meet demand where other ones you've had more supply challenges? I'm just kind of curious about that. And, and the sustainability, is that something we should expect to, to continue to be a little more tilted that direction? Thank you. We are seeing a higher percentage of uh, commons and photonics this year as compared to previous years. That's a good thing. That means that the build-outs that we uh, – uh, the wins that we've had over the past few years are starting to build out, and uh, so you can expect that to be a good thing for our future. What we said was that the uh, gross margin guide for Q2 is as a result of a higher proportion of lower gross margin commons and photonics. So all of that is, you know, sort of of a piece. Jim, the other thing I would add there is, you know, it's also uh, the context of this is a number of wins that we had, you know, frankly, some of these date back to pre-COVID that kind of got put on hold from an operational point of view over the last couple of years, and we're now seeing them deploy. So it's it's new accounts and new customers that we're, we're deploying there, and as Jim said, that's you know it's very positive. It bodes well for uh, their commitment to the future to us. Um, but it's also existing customers now reinvesting in their uh, both capacity and network modernization. So it's this classic sort of line system, photonics, and, and commons, which then will follow as they as they fill in with uh, with cards over time. So it's, it's, it's not really – it is constrained by supply chain, but, you know, we're also seeing it from an order point of view as well. 
Great. Thank you for the insights. It's appreciated. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Your next question is from Tal Liani with Bank of America. Your line is open. Hi, guys. Um, I, I went to see, I went to uh, uh, Mobile World Congress last week, and I was surprised with how much discussion there was for white box routing with pluggables and also pluggables and traditional routers. And uh, it, the question is, I understand that there is great demand the current times, and, and the current build-out is, is probably not with these kind of solutions, but thinking about the long term, what is the implications for demand in your space, and how are you positioned uh, if the market migrates to these kind of solutions? Thanks. Yeah, Cal, so Scott here. Uh, separate out the, sort of the white box phenomena from your second theme there, which is kind of, I'll call it convergence. Um, you know, personally, I think for, for our customer segmentation, we're not really seeing a lot of deployments of the, of the white box piece because, frankly, as you sort of disaggregate the stuff, someone has to put it back together again, and that's typically not the business of our customers. Um, on the convergence piece, you know, for some parts of the network, we do see that as uh, an evolution. And, you know, we've talked about this in our uh, uh, next generation metro and edge capabilities, where we really firmly believe, you know, the winning hand there is going to be best in class optics, best in class photonics, a lightweight routing and switching capabilities, and the off box software control systems that allow you to manage and automate that network. Uh, across the layers cost effectively, and we have been investing in those threads for a long time, and part of the fruits of that investment you're starting to see uh, come, come with the growth in our routing and switching business. But, so your position is it's not going to happen uh, for now because of certain things, and I, I agree with you, but what happens if it happens? Uh, what happens if pluggables are going to um, – are going to be deployed by, by carriers or demanded by cloud companies, does it mean that Siena is going to see uh, shrinkage or decline in demand in the market, or, or, or if well, not, yeah. what so are the yeah. you know, Different parts of the network are going to have different evolutions and solutions. We firmly believe that the core, and, you know, the core infrastructure of the network is not going to sacrifice an ounce of performance, uh, and therefore it's going to continue to be um, you know, separate deployments. As you get closer to the edge, we think the convergence does have a play, and we think that's a great a greater opportunity in the thread is, than it is for us because there is other spend that we are not haven't historically been addressing that is now available to us. Remember, we we talked about an expanded TAM, and part of this is the context of what we're talking about here. Exactly. Got it. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Morgan Stanley. Your line is open. Great. Thanks. Um, maybe just on the second half ramp, um, you know, under three, but just is, should that be a step function as we head towards this gradual ramp of capacity and kind of some of these supply chain models? The second question, I mean, I, I would assume not, um, but any impact to subsea consortiums or any Yeah, what I'd say, Meta, is that uh, um, Q3 has always been a very strong sort of annual sequence of the way our customers operate, and so we will we'll see a, a nice um, in Q3. Uh, you ought to look at the last drive your view of uh, of what this year is going to look like based on last, because that's kind of the way we're thinking. And Meta, on the second part of your question, we, we're not, you know, see early days, but we're not seeing any uh, geopolitical fallout yet on any of the submarine system cables or any of the rest of it. And, you know, frankly, quite, quite the opposite. We're seeing very robust um, demand uh, around the globe uh, for that. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Meta. Your next question is from Mahad. Fahad Najam with Loop Capital. Your line is open. 
Uh, good morning. Thank you for taking my, my question. Uh, Gary, I, I wanted to kind of uh, help, get your help in understanding your comment about strategic investments in increasing supply chain capacity for the second half. Can you elaborate a little bit more? Is it just you procuring more components or are you adding more manufacturing lines? How much of this uh, expansion in, in, in or increase in supply chain capacity is a permanent investment versus um, just buying more inventory? Three swim lanes. Um, one is we're not, you know, we're not following, I guess, the just in time inventory uh, approach of, uh, of yesteryear's on the components that aren't in short supply. So you can see it in our raw material inventory. We've sort of been building that up, waiting for the more constrained components so that we can turn that into finished goods quickly. So that's number one. Number two is we made the decision nine plus months ago to bet heavily on significant growth in our business in the second half of the year and put a you know, significant demand on um, I'll just say the component industry, playing to the rules of their new extended lead time. Um, so we're not expecting any change in lead times, but we made we made that bet a long time ago. And then the third thing is, in order to turn it into finished goods in a um, in a uh, um, faster manner, we we're we've increased our capacity on the production side, largely in the in the test uh, cap, uh, capacity, so we can turn that around. around quickly. So those are the three main things. Okay, so if, 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 if some of the stuff that you invested in is this inventory and some of it is permanent, uh, like the additional task capacity, how should we think about the implications of, on your uh, growth margins going forward if assuming your 6 to 8% got long term, or does that also mean that you're probably better positioned to no. that? perspective, we're really talking about pulling forward investment capacity that we would have put in place in 23 anyways. Okay. Appreciate the answers. Thank you. Thanks, Todd. Your next question comes from the line of Alex Henderson with Needham. Your line is open. Great. Thanks. Um, you made the comment uh, in your prepared remarks that you expect a significant improvement in uh, the back half of the year in terms of components, yet when I talk to virtually everybody else in the industry, uh, they're saying that conditions have not improved and, uh, in fact, may have eroded. Uh, the rate of decommits on, uh, on orders uh, has gone up. Virtually every other manufacturer has done the same thing you've done, which is stretched out um, you know, their orders uh, and committed to significant increases in the future. Um, your third quarter fiscal year is pretty close. I mean, that's the July quarter. Um, so what gives you the confidence that the supply chain conditions are going to improve and you're not going to get decommits, um, you know, based off of what seems to be continued stretching of duration across the entire industry as well as, um, you know, decommits showing up uh, at a lot of other vendors? Uh, so there's a couple of things in there. So let's first of all talk about lead times. From from what we've seen, lead times haven't really changed. They they did a step function a while ago to be you know pretty extreme in terms of the lead times. They haven't gotten worse. They haven't gotten better. And we're not depending on them getting better. We we put orders in a long time ago, playing by the new rules. Um, uh, and betting on our business. And if others didn't make that bet, then I can see they're showing up today trying to do it. They're facing those lead times, and they're stretched out. Um, now, what we've been following very, very carefully, whether or not those component suppliers have been delivering to their new and advertised lead times, and for the most part, I'd say, yes, they have. Um, then you talked about decommits. I actually, um, from our perspective, you know, the decommits in terms of the quantity of them um, haven't really changed uh, they're happening, absolutely. Uh, I would actually say they're actually less severe than they were three to six months ago in the sense of the, the numbers are probably the same, but the magnitude 
of the decommits are different. And if you go back three to six months, what we were seeing is de decommits pushing out quarters on, um, at a time and sometimes not even, you know, recon reconfirming the quantities. Now we're talking about those quantities are showing up, but the impacts are days and weeks. So that's what we're seeing in, in, in our supply chain. So, you know, we made these bets a long time ago, Alex, and if others are trying to make them today, I can understand the difference. Okay. Um, second question, if I could. Um, you talked about your strategy around pricing, and, and I understand it. It makes sense. Uh, it's consistent with Sienna's strategy historically. Some of your competitors, though, have been much more aggressive on price, uh, particular, uh, you know, at Cisco, uh, has had multiple price increases. Um, have you seen a change in the pricing environment, um, you know, from the competition, whether it be Cisco, Nokia, or some of the other vendors that are in the field that's uh, creating a little bit of a, a benefit to you um, in terms of share as well? I, I think it's it's too early to tell on all of that, to be honest. I mean, and I think you know some of these things get announced, and a lot of it, a lot of the sort of price increases are, are that that some of the people you talked about there are really in the enterprise space, which I think you've seen more aggressive price increases too. So I. I you know, some of that bleeds across for sure, you know, and as Jim talked about earlier, you know, we're in an unprecedented, uh, you know, environment from a, a price uh, dynamic in, in, the, in the carrier and infrastructure space. I think that's pretty much playing through how we'd anticipated. We, we have had some very constructive conversations with most of our, with all of our major customers. Um, they understand that situation and, and, you know, we, that will start to play through over the next one to, one to three years. Um, but we really haven't seen any uh, massive changes in the competitive environment. It's really, you know, particularly right now, all of that is hidden by all of the constraints around supply. So, you know, it's more about can you supply something than what the price is, um, you know, frankly. Uh, and so it's going to take a little bit longer for that to play through. I would say this, though. You know, given, you know, Scott's comments around the scale of the commitments that we've made to our supply chain and the step up that we've, we've taken in that, uh, you know, a long period of time ago, our guidance of 11 to 13 percent growth this year on revenues, the order backlog that we've shared with you, what's absolutely crystal clear is that we're going to be taking market share this year and beyond. Super. Thank you very much. And Thanks, Alex. Your final question comes from the line of Samit Chatterjee with J.P. Morgan. Your mm -hmm. line is open. Hi. Uh, thanks for squeezing me in here. Um, just if I could start on gross margin, um, and Jim, um, just wanted to see if I could get some color on you now reiterating the gross margin guide for the full year, uh, which is great to see. But can you maybe share any quantification of what the impact from the supply chain costs or higher supply chain costs will continue to be? On, for the fiscal year, and the second part to that quickly is uh, how should I think about the better software um, that you had driving the better gross margin in F1Q? How should we think about that carrying forward to the full year? I know I understand it's a wide range, but is software now going to be doing better in terms of revenue for the full year than you imagined earlier because of the strong start, and does that flow through to the full year margins? Thank you. Um, yes. Now, it, I'm going to use some numbers here, and I think you ought to be really careful with these numbers because I have to in order to illustrate the point, right? The last time we talked about our long-term gross margins, before COVID, we centered them around 45%, roughly. That's, that's what we centered our view of gross margins. We then went through a COVID period of time in which capacity was the most uh, in-demand quantity, and, um, and so therefore our gross margins did go up quite nicely to the high 40s. We said, though, that they were going to get back to uh, these, uh, you know, once we got through the COVID period of capacity ads and get back to more uh, balanced mix of line systems and uh, comments and photonics and capacity that we would naturally get back toward that mid-40s range. <clears throat> so, you know, where are we and all that? 
uh, that's, uh, I think we're, we're heading toward that period of time where we're back in that range. However, uh, we guided this year to 43 to 46. <clears throat> Again, just taking the midpoint of the range, that's 44 and a half percent. So, you know, you, you could sort of quantify that the um, effect of the uh, extra cost in our supply chain based on that difference. Now, I would caution you to not make any absolute, you know, judgments about this, but that's sort of in the range of where we are. Now, the other thing that always has an effect on our margin is mix. And uh, we, you know, it's a mix of the type of products, stages of the uh, various projects that we have with our customers, uh, software, all those things do uh, impact our gross margin, and it's hard to call. But I, I'd say this, we've, we've been pleased with the fact we've been able to maintain uh, gross margins in this, you know, sort of unprecedented period of cost increases. And uh, we expect over time that we'll get back to something more like the, the long-range number that we had projected earlier and perhaps better. And are you thinking software, what, how's your expectation for software change given the strong start? Well, uh, we, we had an unusually high quarter in, in Q1, but software is, is part of our strategy. We've invested pretty uh, heavily in our Blue Planet mix. We've also added a lot of capabilities on the platform side with MCP. I think we have an industry-leading uh, management system. And so, uh, yes, that's definitely going to be a higher percentage of our revenue. We, we think it's going to be a higher percentage of our revenue going forward, and that'll help with gross margin. Thank you. Thanks for taking my questions. Thanks, Amik, and thanks, everyone. We appreciate it. Again, we express our care and concern for all the Ukrainian people and our hopes for a peaceful future. We look forward to seeing everyone at OFC. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your participation. This concludes today's conference call. You may now